What is app tracking transparency? When do you need to use it? Can you measure marketing effectiveness without it? And how do you ensure that you are ATT compliant? Welcome to Growth Masterminds with John Goods here. There are a ton of questions about iOS 14 and Apple's new IDFA rules, and ATT is right at the heart of all of them. Today, we're going to talk to Singular CTO, Aron Friedman, about all of them. We're going to ask him all the questions, get all the answers, and figure everything out. Uh, that's no small order for you there, Aron, but uh, I, I suspect you can do it. Let's kick it off right here, uh, right at the end of the beginning, which is a good place to start. What is ATT? What is the app tracking transparency framework? Right. Um, so um, the app tracking transparency framework, or nicknamed the ATT, is a new framework introduced by Apple uh, starting from iOS 14, which essentially uh, requires to ask users for consent before tracking them across apps or websites owned by other companies. In a nutshell, it's very similar to how you're required to request con consent for using the camera, the location, the photos of the app. Now there's a new type of consent, and now it specifically uh, refers to user tracking, basically. Now, it pops up when you download a new app, but is it only about apps? Is it also about mobile web, anything like that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So. In effect, basically, the framework is supported, is supported only by native apps. So only in native apps, you're required to show that pop-up and ask for permissions. But in terms of like the permission itself and kind of the wording, they also refer to users coming from websites. In a sense, you're asking permission to track those users from apps or websites coming to the apps. So less in terms of like the support on the website itself, the mobile browser doesn't support ATT. But in terms of like the user experience, you're still required to to still adhere to the permissions also for website uh, tracking. And we'll see in the future, perhaps Apple will release something with at least mobile Safari or something like that that will integrate with it, with ATT and and perhaps SK Ad Network, which is kind of the next question, right? I mean, if you're new to all of the things that Apple is doing with iOS 14 and privacy, you've been hearing about ATT, you've been hearing about SK Ad Network. How do they come together? How are they related? Right. So if ATT is focused on uh, the tracking of a specific user, which requires their consent, SK Network is kind of the alternative framework. It's actually a framework that Apple introduced already in iOS 11 and then in iOS 14, they've made a huge upgrade for it. But in essence, what it provides is a way to measure your campaigns, measure your marketing efforts in an aggregated, anonymized way. Um, so in a sense, you can use it for marketing measurement and attribution, basically, without the requirement of showing ATT at all, for that matter, because it doesn't track specific users. That makes a ton of sense. So now we're going to get into alphabet soup. And, and I know mobile marketing is an alphabet soup. You know, I, there's so many different acronyms here. There's ATT, right? There's LAT, there's ITP. So we talk about app tracking transparency. We talk about LAT, limit ad tracking. We talk about ITP, intelligent tracking prevention. What are all these different things? How are they related? Yeah. So definitely, I'm sure that can there can be a lot of confusion around of the acronyms. So ATT we've just talked about. It's basically the new framework introduced in iOS 14. Um, LAT, or limited ad tracking, is kind of its predecessor. And it works a bit differently from uh, um, ATT in the regard that it was a simple setting option from in the iOS device that you can kind of click off and disable all uh, kind of limit your ad tracking, which was a very technical term. It essentially kind of zeroed your ID fade, which is the identifier used for tracking users across apps and websites owned by other companies. So that's kind of the previous one before ATT. And ATT basically replaced uh, that set. And the setting is, still exists in the iOS device in iOS 14, but is now uh, implemented using ATT. Maybe to start, touch base a bit about ITP, this is even like an, uh, maybe a, a bit of an older term, which comes basically from uh, mobile web. It's uh, ITP is an acronym for intelligent uh, tracking uh, prevention and basically refers to a new standard that Apple introduced a, a few years ago, basically in their Safari to do very similar things to what we're talking about with uh, limited ad tracking just for website tracking. So limited, limiting fingerprinting for website tracking and so forth. Yeah, that all makes sense. So thank you for that. Now, 
Let's talk about fingerprinting and ATT. Does ATT limit fingerprinting? We talked about this a little bit briefly in a previous episode. Maybe hit it uh, at a high level again. If I don't have ATT, can I fingerprint? If I do, am I allowed to fingerprint? Can you give us the broad strokes there? Right. So that's actually one of the, I think, main differences also between ATT and, and LAT, kind of the predecessor. Uh, when you activated limited ad tracking before iOS 14, the only effect was that you couldn't get the IDFA anymore, but there weren't any specific policies uh, against fingerprinting or anything around that. Uh, with ATT now, you're basically, besides the, the fact that uh, if you can only get access to IDFA if you show the pop-up, there are also requirements to not do any type of tracking, including fingerprinting, if you didn't receive the user's consent. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, does it limit uh, kinds of fingerprinting? Yes, obviously, if the user didn't uh, give permission to do that. But there are certain use cases that we've also talked about in the previous podcast, and kind of which, uh, if you get the appropriate uh, consent, then you're allowed to track the user, again, across uh, apps or websites, maybe owned by your own company with various tracking solutions. That makes sense. Let's talk about getting consent because that's been a big question, right? Can I get consent? How do I get consent? Will I get consent if I ask for it? What rate will people give consent? Uh, let's start here. Does a developer have only one shot to get consent? Yeah, so the developer has only one shot to show the pop-up, basically, yeah. from when the app is uh, run for the first time. Once you show the pop-up and you get the basically the decision, you can't show it again. However, Apple does provide an option in their policies to uh, potentially ask the user again in the future and basically provide them a link to the settings in which the user can still kind of change their opinion later on. So that's actually allowed by Apple. They actually refer to it in uh, one of their FAQs. And it also gives the option to the user to change their mind to the opposite direction as well. Like they might allow you tracking in the beginning, but then decide that they want to opt out later on. So, the setting option allows both options to create that. That's kind of a big deal because in the past we've thought, hey, if somebody wanted to change their limit ad tracking setting, they have to go down a lot of menus to a lot of different places and figure out where it is. Being able to provide a direct link, that's kind of a big deal because you can explain a little bit about what you want, why you want it, how you use any data that you get. That brings up another question, which is incentivization or explanation. What are the tools that a developer has to kind of maximize opt-in rate if they do want and need the IDFA? Yeah. So uh, Apple actually clarified some of these uh, questions in their uh, latest FAQ as well. And kind of uh, briefly speaking, Apple allows you to explain to the user uh, why do you need uh, to ask for their permission, what exactly are the use cases, and they actually it's even encouraged, basically. However, incentivizing users or limiting some of the capabilities because they don't want to be tracked is not allowed as part of uh, Apple's policies. Uh, and you're also required, of course, not to provide any misleading explanations or you know, basically hiding information. So there's bunch of policies on how to explain exactly what's allowed to explain or not, and how to still provide the service of the user regardless if they want to be tracked or not. Right, right. Okay, you go through it, you pop up the ATT framework, somebody says, you know what, I trust you, I'm going to say yes, and that you they grant their consent. Now, does ATT introduce any limitations on how you use their data, what you do with it, when you get that consent? Uh, yeah, of course. Apple uh, definitely released some more, again, policies on uh, how to treat the uh, user's tracking, even if they provide you consent. And just to give like a couple of examples, if the user, for example, changed their opinion later on and decided to stop giving you uh, permission, then you're required to respect their decision and not only stop tracking them, but also make sure to disassociate any previous information, kind of reset their information uh, as well. So there's definitely uh, things that you have to do if you change your mind. Another piece is you can't kind of store or cache their information in case they provided you, uh, provide the information once, you can not start kind of storing it for later on and using it uh, for other apps of yours, for example, without their uh, intention. So there's definitely various policies that are important to kind of learn and read about to make sure that you're fully compliant with these. 
And that's a really interesting one, right? I mean, if somebody grants permission, you start using their data in approved ways, but they then revoke their permission. All of a sudden, you've got some work to do. You've got to do some deletion. You've got to do some disassociation. And that means you need some technology in place to be able to do that. That's interesting. It's kind of reminiscent of GDPR. And perhaps, hopefully, people will be able to use the same technology, uh, at least the same frameworks on their own end uh, to, to do that work. But let's talk about SSO. SSO has been an interesting one. There's been a lot of talk about how Facebook, for instance, or Google would do SSO and would that require ATT, would that require IDFA? Let's just ask that. Does SSO require ATT consent? Right. So to be very specific, um, as Apple clarified in their, again, policies and even the FEQ in which they refer specifically to SSO, uh, Apple says that SSO requires ATT consent if it's being used also for tracking users, again, across apps and websites uh, owned by other companies. So if you take Facebook or Google as an example, if you use Facebook's SSO and on the meantime, basically send them information to be used for targeting information and tracking those users or getting more information about the user from Facebook, then it's considered user tracking and you're required to ask for consent. But if you're using a very limited version of an SSO that doesn't share any information for tracking or uh, targeting purposes, then it's allowed to use SSO without consent. And in fact, I believe that Facebook has recently released a kind of a limited SSO SDK yeah. version exactly for these purposes, probably yeah. because of this policy. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so lots of ideas here, lots of information, lots of understanding what you can or can't do. Let's talk about compliance. Um, I built an app. I published it, it's out there. I'm not collecting IDFA. I'm not popping up ATT, not planning to track or anything like that. Am I definitely out of the box ATT compliant? All right. So I think the question that you should ask yourself is whether you are tracking, again, your users coming from different websites or, or apps basically owned by other companies. So definitely if you're not using IDFA, you're not uh, putting it that it's one step of the equation, but also, if you're, for example, collecting a login, let's say, like collecting your email, and then sending that email for to Facebook or for retargeting purposes, then it's still considered a matter of tracking, even though you didn't touch the IDFA. And that's not allowed without asking for permission. So I think the general question that you should ask broadly is, how exactly are you treating those users and whether you are tracking those across uh, other apps or websites? In other words, you're not compliant by default. It's not business as usual. You've got to think hard about what you're doing, how you're doing it, and make sure that you're still okay. Which brings up another question, right? We've had so many different privacy regulations, laws in different jurisdictions uh, that have been introduced in the recent years. We've got GDPR in Europe. We've got CCPA in California. We've got COPA across the United States for child protection. Are they all kind of converging? Uh, are they complementary? How do I kind of navigate this pea soup of all these different regulations? Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. And uh, first of all, the, the answer should be by your legal counsel uh, uh, for <laughs> all these privacy regulations, of course. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, it is a question that advertisers are kind of uh, asking. And, you know, ATT by Apple isn't, you know, uh, wasn't built to necessarily solve the GDPR, be uh, completely aligned with GDPR, CCPA, or COPA in a sense. There are some connections between those two, some positive, some uh, some less, but definitely in terms of like how they are aligned, the, the best recommendation I could say is to uh, get a, a consultation from your uh, legal advice. <laughs> um, yeah, I would note, like, just as an interesting anecdote, there is uh, COPA, for example, for children protection, uh, for a long while, they were very limited in terms of how they could track users uh, in iOS devices because the only way was with ID Fenders. Of course, tons of limitations on whether you can even use ID Fender for any sort of tracking. Uh, now with SK Network, SK Network basically doesn't involve user tracking. So now it can potentially open up options for children directed apps to start using SK Network for measurement, which is, I think, pretty positive news for them. That's a really big deal, actually, and it's kind of interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because I had a webinar recently. We were talking about IDFA and iOS 14, and I asked that question. And in our prep doc, we had that question, and uh, the panelists did not know the answer, whether you could track 
marketing measurement, measure the effectiveness of your marketing with kids apps with SK Ad Network. And it's good to hear that you can because it is privacy safe. Okay, so when you've got rules, uh, when you've got regulations, you've also often got enforcement. Uh, what kind of enforcement is there for ATT, for iOS 14, IDFA uh, privacy regulations? Right. So, um, you know, Apple has actually in the latest announcement that they had like a few weeks ago with kind of the new FAQ, they've actually added some more uh, wording around enforcement basically for ATT. And they've made it very clear now that uh, if they would find out that anyone is uh, basically not compliant with their policies, then they would be able to reject apps from the apps or even remove them completely, including the developer account, if they would find out that companies are not compliant. And I think this is, they've been using pretty aggressive wording, I would say, and I think uh, you know, to me, it feels like they're basically saying, we mean business and don't test us out in mm -hmm. a sense, but that's kind of how they're using to, what they're using to, uh, to enforce these. And my assumption there is that they'll be using some automated technology to look into the code that's submitted to the app store and make sure that check if ATT is being requested, for instance, and some other things on a very high level, simple level, perhaps more detailed, more complex. We'll see about that, but also relying on tips from users who see something and complain about something, perhaps even looking at reviews on the app store on apps and stuff like that. So you definitely don't want to be caught in that situation. You definitely don't want to be in that scenario uh here's the <laughs> i'm leaving the easy question to the end uh joke this is a really really tough one how do you can, how can you be 100 sure that your company is att compliant right um yeah so uh, you know my recommendation would be to learn about the material or work with a partner obviously that can consult to you on on these details and really there's like great faqs and and relatively clear uh, policy guidelines by Apple. And we've been writing about it, of course, on our blog, kind of explaining exactly limitations for fingerprinting and for ATT and exactly what to do. So uh, what I would recommend is just, you know, check our blog and Apple's policies to see uh, how you can be compliant to these. Excellent. Excellent. Aran, we didn't think we'd get through all these questions. Uh, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of detail. You did an amazing job breaking it down, making it very, very simple. Thank you so much.